All right, so with me is Susanna Carmen, a dear friend and colleague down in Australia, who's been working with Meta Integral and kind of part of our Meta Integral network down there for a number of years. Um, she's related to Dema Carmen, who's a colleague that helped me found Meta Integral and the Academy in particular. But you and I first connected when you were part of the EPC program. And so why don't you share a little bit about kind of your background um, and what brought you into EPC and then, you know, find a way to then connect to the Meta Impact framework and kind of how it was to encounter that framework and what grabbed your attention about it. And then maybe in our conversation, we just can kind of explore the ways you've engaged that framework, you know, over the last couple of years. Great. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this conversation. It's very exciting. Um, so a little bit about my background. I have a very eclectic uh, background and I go, as people like to say, I have like a lot of breadth and depth in my background. So I have degrees in environmental science, education, music and music performance, um, and psychotherapy, somatic psychotherapy. And um, I had worked in all of those fields and had uh, just before being enrolled into doing the EPC by Dana, I was working in a business consulting firm. I had left sort of working in the arts and uh, working in the psychotherapeutic space because I, I got convinced that those skill sets were needed in sort of the executive business coaching domain and that I could be providing value in that space. But I very quickly became disillusioned working for a, um, a UK-based uh, business consulting company. And I realized it wasn't my home, although I, I did learn a lot. And at that time, I was in conversation with Dana. And he said, oh, come do EPC. This will be great. And, you know, I also have a deep commitment to my own reflective practice and my own sort of human development, my own interior um, growth journey. And so anything that's going to have me grow and evolve um, both my thinking, you know, my thinking and my feeling and my being, I'm like 100% ready to dive into those spaces. So I did. And, and in that time, um, uh, I was, I was one of those people who was very happy to surrender to the wonderful structure that you created, Sean. <laughs> and I did everything. I know. You were like the top student. That was awesome. <laughs> I was the teacher's pet. Yeah. Just because I was leaving, I was in the midst of a, of a transition and I was leaving one, I was in a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty in my own, my own life journey and my own professional journey. And so I was ready to grab hold of any, any kind of structure that anybody was going to give me. If it was like instructions on how to clean up toilet bowl properly, I was going to follow that to the T. So, um, but by doing that, um, I realized through that process that what was going to integrate all of my skills, capacities, and experiences, and my sort of commitment to you know, uh, human evolution and the alleviation of all suffering everywhere was through the doorway of design and the design of human systems. And um, that became really clear, um, both as a, you know, my background in, in, as an artist and where I wanted to head. It just helped me step into those unknown territories with a deep trust in my own capacity, with that as my identity moving forward. So following um, the EPC course, I then started a master's degree in design futures and am working with many of your tools and the meta impact framework um, with my clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember, you know, when I was presenting the meta impact framework, like it seemed like it really touched into your design sensibilities, you know, and you and I kind of share a love of design and have had a lot of emails and exchanges around, oh, look at this article, or, you know, here's a program that looks interesting. And, you know, I think over the last few years, I've really kind of come to realize that I'm first and foremost a designer. Um, and it took me a while to realize that because I'm not a graphic designer, you know, but I, I design, you know, architectures of, you know, leadership programs, and I design integrative systems. And when I kind of realized that the meta impact framework as it was an example of the kind of design work that I do, which is like integrating a lot of different elements that then supports the design in this case of, you know, wisdom economies, like how do we design systems that highlight value that can be cultivated and exchanged in a transparent, open, sustainable, holistic, 
transparent way, you know. And so, so I've actually really enjoyed our conversations because your love and focus on design has kind of helped me claim, you know, that aspects um, of myself and, and the ways in which I'm a designer. So. Yeah, and when I first saw it, I mean, I never, when, when you first presented it, I mean, it was, it was I, I, you know, it was very succinct and clever, but I immediately looked at the, there was another designer in that, in that room, which was Lisa Norton, and I looked at it, and I looked at her, and I said, wow, oh, it's a great design tool. It's a great, mm. great way of building expressive and receptive capacity. You can talk about, you know, you can zoom out really far. You can see the big picture. Then you can zoom in. And I started to play with it, um, you know, both like on the eye level, the personal level. So I was starting to play with it in my relationship with my husband. You know, who's generating value? What kind of value? How are we exchanging value? What values, you know, explicit? What values implicit? You know, how are we co-designing our life together around wealth that's mm. beyond just financial capital or manufactured capital? What's my value? What's my? So I really took a deep dive, as I tend to do. Yeah. So I could get inside of the, or I could let, let the, the meta frame get inside of me and, and be very dynamic and alive. And so that was kind of in that I space. And then um, I did the master class yeah. with that integral. And from there, a, a project emerged. So I could kind of move it into the we and the it space. Right. Um, and this was, um, well, I got invited in October of 2016 by a regional economic development not-for-profit. Um, it's called Sourdough Business Pathways to join an all-women brains trust that could, I guess, strategically respond to the specific needs of women in business in our region. Um, and so this organization was, it was creating a joint initiative with, with a regional um, sort of adult learning college um, and its purpose or its mandate has been to help grow businesses and jobs. It's kind of jobs and growth, jobs and growth. And I could see from the conversation that it was very focused on human capital and financial capital and some manufacture cap capital in a regional area. Um, and I think I went to some kind of event where there was someone representing um, the New South Wales Regional Development Department. And that was the main dialogue. That was the conversation. And other people in the room would put their hand up and go, but what about cultural capital? I mean, they weren't saying it like that, but it was like, we're the film industry. What about the cultural capital? And where the, what about social capital? And what about um, in um, natural capital? And you could see that everyone was standing, standing up from their wedge, right. but no one could see the whole, mm. the whole circle. Yeah. And I thought, uh, what a great opportunity because it was very clear very quickly with this group of women that they wanted more than just right hand side value. They really wanted to grow tacit value, particularly in the form of knowledge and social mm -hmm. capital. And that as women, they could see the interdependence between growing that value and then, I mean, they might not have been able to create a direct causal relationship, but they could see the interdependence as how women build networks and women build opportunity, um, that they wanted to grow those things alongside their capabilities and I guess top line revenue growth of their businesses. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, it's such a great image of kind of each person speaking from their wedge, you know, right. the meta capital system. And, you know, I think that's one of the powers of the framework is when I was designing it, I was really trying to have as many forms of capital that we needed for an optimal level of expressive and receptive capacity, which I really like the, the way you were pointing to that. Um, but to, to have as few as possible so it wasn't overly burdensome. And so those 10 capitals, you know, they could be 12, they could be 20, you know, they could be six, you know, like you can kind of expand them and, um, and divide them as needed. But I think there is a way in which the 10 together um, really cover the basis, you know, and so in those kinds of conversations where people are speaking to the, the elements that are not being included as much as they want, you do often tend to see them kind of representing, you know, one or two of the, the different pies, you know, of the different types of value or capital. And I think that's one of the powers of it is that it can give you that meta framework to kind of point to that and say, oh, here's a way we can coordinate all of these perspectives so they're not positioned against each other where you're having to choose between cultural capital and financial capital. I mean, what a horrible position to try and put yourself into. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. let's, Let's find a way to design it so that we can amplify both. Um, and I remember just going back to something else you were saying. I remember in the master's class when you shared that example 
of using the framework in the context of your marriage, um, how delighted I was because I had never thought of the framework in that kind of personal context. Like I'd always just thought of it as kind of an organizational design tool. And it was so refreshing to have you share your experience of, of using those distinctions to have really powerful and important conversations with your husband that allowed the two of you, in a sense, to talk about the wisdom economy of your own household, right? And the way each of you were contributing to that and, and making that more visible. And I, I recall in that moment of you sharing that with the class that all of a sudden I got, holy smokes, like this framework is actually even more powerful and important than I realized because it can actually serve in, in those kinds of, you know, dimensions and, and conversations as well. It doesn't have to just be confined to, you know, economic discussions, you know, in an expanded way or even an organizational context. Like we can actually use it to look at team dynamics. We can use it to look at our own personal growth and development, you know. And so, so that was really refreshing and, and a wonderful gift that you gave me by kind of, you know, and I tend to be a really big picture thinker. So it was kind of like amazing. I hadn't even thought of it in that context. And here you were giving this really delightful example of, of that. So, so thank you for yeah, it also revealed, I mean, as you're saying that, it, it revealed inside of that sort of inter, intersubjective space what happens in power dynamics mm -hmm. when value being generated isn't made visible. Right. So, you know, in this project with these women, there was a point where I was mapping out um, not just, well, first, what's the value being generated that we're not fully acknowledging amongst the stakeholders? Yeah. So like, you know, we had this, um, we started with this question, like, given the pace, scope and scale of technology's impact on the future of work, what are the specific needs of women in business in our regional area? And how might we work together um, skillfully to fulfill them? And we had all of this value, like we had a place to convene in, uh, this college campus. We could use a brand that already had social capital, it had huge equity in the community. It was you know, it far exceeded the local chamber of commerce in terms of its status with state and regional development um, uh, organizations and, and in the public sector. So we have this, you know, and being able to map all the value out across the, mm. the, the wheel or whatever we're going to yeah. call it, across the framework, made visible the contribution people were already making. And so suddenly, before we even started, everyone could feel kind of given to and have the opportunity to be acknowledged for what they were already contributing. Mm -hmm. And so many times, particularly in that not-for-profit sector, I think, or my experience working with different clients is everyone forgets to acknowledge the value that's being generated. Yeah. Um, the fixations on insufficiency, not on sufficiency. So it really kind of enlivened that, you know, it went from being able to practice that in my own individual relationship to the larger intersubjective sort of, you know, shared commitment to contribution that when made visible, it makes everyone feel wealthy already, even before you've done anything with it. So wow, and this is so beautiful and so important. And it's like, I often talk about one of the core things the framework does is it makes value visible, but you're, and I usually talk about in a third person sense, kind of like the value in the system, but you're highlighting the very important kind of first and second person dynamics where when, when we are able to make visible the value that we're bringing to a project, an initiative, an organization, and are able to see the value that others are bringing and see that there's different kinds of value, there's psychological value, there's social value, there's human skills value, there's health and well-being, there's financial value, that allows us to see other people and to be seen. And, and the act of seeing and being seen, ultimately for me, is an act of love. Right? So it allows us to bring love into the process, you know, and I think that's part of what I'm trying to capture when I call it like wisdom economies, right? It's kind of like, because to me, wisdom and love are very much connected. And, and so I think there is a way in which it brings wholeness to a marriage, to a team, to an organization, because it allows what's already there to be seen and to be identified and acknowledged and appreciated. And you're right, I think a lot of the framework isn't even necessarily about identifying how we can generate more value in these different areas, but right. simply recognizing what value is already here. If we don't in, in generate any more value, like there's a ton of wealth already here. And then as a group of women, if we recognize the social capital we have through association with this brand, if we realize, you know, the psychological capital we have as being, you know, smart, empowered women who 
know they can change the world, you know, by looking at our strengths and skill sets, we have a lot of human cap, you know, it's like you start to realize how wealthy you are. And then it's like, then you're even more empowered to then make the change that you're wanting to see in the world. So I think that's a really important piece that you're highlighting. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because I use the meta meta impact framework across the whole project, which has been like 24 months now. Yeah, I was going to um, ask, because it started, yeah. if it's, is it still going on since October 2016? Oh, let's see. So maybe that's more like, sorry, maybe that's more like 18 months. Yeah. So it's still going on, and there were like three components to, to the project. The first was, and I applied the meta-impact framework along with another sort of what I'm calling a transdisciplinary meta-toolkit yeah. um, to three areas. One was, you know, how do we, even before we start any kind of, you know, change process or transformation process or even responding to needs or even finding out what those needs are, um, you know, how do we become a cohesive distributed leadership team and how might we use the, left the framework and some other tools in that, in that way? And then, you know, okay, so how might we respond to the needs of those we are designing for? Yeah. And then how are we going to measure the efficacy of our initiatives, of our efforts? Because it's, it's all wonderful to be in the process of it, but I think this is a very design um, orientation and you know it's it is sort of managing that dynamic between process and outcome but I think in particular <clears throat> this thing of design generating something in the material coming through the material space that is then feed, creates a feedback loop back into you know mindsets behaviors and relationships that create the conditions for change or transformation or transition to something new so just sort of looking at what is that prototype, what is that material outcome that's going to feed back mm. and create a virtuous loop um, around transformation and change and how people think and relate and behave. So, mm. um, yeah, so we used the meta impact framework. And first, I used it really to help hold the multiplicity of perspectives because we had a group of very powerful independent thinking women convening trying to align around one vision. And that took eight months. Wow. <laughs> that was like wow. a huge investment and a lot of um, uh, depolarizing pers people's perspectives and, and trying to bring people together. And so we used the meta impact frame or I introduced it to support that around. Um, yes, yeah, sort of everybody's perspective, you know, is heuristic and it matters and how can we include it? And then how can it provide us a structure for how we might self-organize as well as a framework for measuring the efficacy of the prototypes we created. Yeah. And how did the women respond to it? Like, did it seem abstract? Did it seem intuitive? Did it seem like just a, another tool they could take or leave or kind of what was the range of response yeah. and engagement? Some, for some people, cause we started with 11 and then we, we eventually, converged on six people, which I think is a little bit easier to manage as a sort of project, working project team. Some people found it a little overwhelming, yeah. but I would say a lot of people really appreciated that we got out from the how and the detail and we got to kind of, like it enabled us to almost sit on the moon with like, you know, in a lawn chair with a drink and an umbrella and look back at the whole system together and it took time to build a shared language, but eventually we were able to do that. <clears throat> and, you know, some of the other things that were part of our vocabulary was, you know, using the language of the meta impact framework, but also human centered design. So the principles of design, being comfortable with not knowing the ambiguity, stepping into the, into the problem statement with humility and curiosity and being really genuine and, and also a willingness to stand in the shoes of the other stakeholders, not just ourselves to capture information and, and seek perspectives. And then, so that was like using human-centered design in terms of the principles or the shared values it brings to a change process, but then using human-centered design, the process itself, the methodology of how you go about seeking perspectives, um, capturing them, coordinating them, synthesizing them, converging on like the real brief, and then starting to ideate about what those initiatives and experiment through different ideas until, you're, until you sort of have some prototypes that you can pull together and then offer and test. Yeah. So we kind of use that as well. And then we also used, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead and then I'll ask. We also used um, developmental theory, adult developmental theory, but I, I didn't, it was going to be too hard to really bring that into the discourse. So I tried to just sort of bring Robert Keegan's three levels of development, the sort of socialized mind, self-authoring and self-transforming, you know, as a way of framing up if, the audience we're talking to 
<clears throat> the, you know, the audience we're designing for in order to really be, in order to generate a prototype with, with that particular audience, they need to have at the minimum like an entrepreneurial mindset. They needed to be at a self-authoring level of development and, and trying, we just really sort of looked at what that might mean and the language and how we'd communicate with that group of people to invite um, participation in testing and validating some of our ideas. Uh, wow, that's very cool. Um, so I was wondering, you know, as the women learned to work with the model and got familiar with the language and the distinctions, in what ways did the Meta Impact Framework kind of affirm their intuition and their orientation around kind of a, a, a bigger view? And in what ways did the model actually expand their view or vision of what's possible? So in what ways it kind of affirm who they were and in what ways did it kind of stretch and expand them into new ways of being? Okay, well that's really interesting. In the way that it affirmed, this both arose out of the intention of the core leadership team, which was they all knew that women, or they had an intuition that women needed more than just building skills and growing like top line revenue of their businesses or you know, generating revenue. They all knew you know, it's about relationships, it's about deep and meaningful connection. It's about, you know, building not just a social capital like I know this person, I know that person, or, you know, attending yet another networking event. It was that women liked, you know, as you know, that's like sticking needles in your eye. It's like really <laughs> deep dive relating and network building, not just shallow um, connectivity, but deep dive connectivity, co-creating together. So they all knew that that was really important for women because through that. Um, and those are really mostly the, the left hand capitals. Correct. Yes. And then they also knew that this kind of shift in mindset, um, particularly around growing knowledge in the space around leadership, ways of relating, ways of being with others, um, ways of being with self, capacities for listening and communicating differently, that really mattered too. So when we went out to do the perspective seeking activities, which included, you know, co-sensing at uh, larger events. I did some interviewing. We even as a small group <laughs> played with like sand tray kind of stuff because one of the other women in the group had a Jungian psychotherapy background. Mm -hmm. So we had like, you know, figurines of archetypes and what would they think and how would they feel and what would their new future look like. So we really were looking as different um, perspectives in the system. Uh, in doing that, I think we, we sort of brought rigor to our own intuition about the importance of those tacit interior individual and collective oh. capacities that were that are particularly important to women when they're growing their businesses mm. wow. or their careers or whatever project they're passionate about. Yeah. Mm. And then what stretched everybody, I think, was the idea that you could... Um, Target particular areas of value that you wanted to grow, design initiatives from that, and then measure the, you know, measure the currencies of growth that you were trying to grow in each of those capitals, and that that could then reinforce and tell a really compelling story about what is actually important to women, what they care about, what they'll invest in, and, and what they need, what they need both tacit and explicit support around what, what kind of, you know, what kind of funding and, and targeted in what ways would really support them in terms of their needs that just targeting growing skills might not be what women want in growing their businesses. Right. Wow. That I hope felt, I've explained that sufficiently. Yeah, no, I think so. And it, it really underscores, you know, one of the things that I often say is one of the core values of the framework is it allows us to tell more powerful stories about what we're doing, what we want to do, about the kind of impact that we're having. Um, and also, you know, this piece around, I think, the approach to, to measuring, you know, in first, second, third person, you know, it allows a, a democratization of assessment that's not just confined to kind of the typical KPIs that are usually associated with this kind of work. But it's like, there's a lot of creative ways that we can measure, track, and make visible these values and their growth and their development and their, you know, how they increase. And then we can tell a story about that. That's very compelling to donors, investors, stakeholders. Um, so I'm curious to hear more about kind of the integral metric strategy 
that emerged out of this engagement, given what you've just said about them realizing they could actually design around, you know, different, you know, values and, you know, identify first, second, or third person ways of measuring and assessing that value to then feed that into a larger narrative around why are they doing what they're doing and how can others be involved and support what they're doing. Um, so say more about the integral metric strategy and how maybe that builds on what you're saying or maybe it takes us in kind of a different direction. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so many things are flashing before my eyes as you were speaking. One of them is it's great to know that you can because sometimes it's a huge investment to try and build those partnerships with research institutions to reduce right. the evidence and get that stamp, this work, you know, this, right. this, get, this does do what you think it does. And sometimes there's a first step I find before that happens where we as um, practitioners and drivers of, um, you know, from community building to wisdom economy projects, we could be actually gathering that evidence for the purpose of storytelling that would then invite other people to engage and bring up the next level of rigor and investment in research. Yeah. So um, our approach was, well, what, what I suggest we do is start with the meta impact framework, identify which of the capitals we wanted to grow. Um, and interestingly, I don't know if this is just kind of a tangent. I'm wondering too, if depending on the developmental level of the context and culture you're right. working with, what they're going to select right. to try and grow is going to change, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, this group selected growing knowledge uh, capability. So I put that under the human capital yeah. um, wedge, social capital and uh, financial capital. No, that's and good. That, one from each of the impacts. Yes, one from each impact. And that we as an organization didn't have to have, we had five initiatives that came out that we wanted to test. We didn't have to have all five of those initiatives at the center, yeah. as the unit of, at the center of the, um, of the framework. We could have a, one initiative grow particular value. They didn't have to grow all four. And another initiative grow different value. Nice. Um, so we kind of spent some strategic time together first deciding what we collectively as an organization wanted to grow value in and then which initiatives would grow which type of value. Wow, that's really cool because I think one of the mistakes that people sometimes make is, especially as integral lists, you know, people that are wanting to kind of include it all, it's like we feel like somehow we have to grow the value in all 10 capitals. But I think having a more strategic view of just working with a few capitals, working with a few, you know, metrics, and then targeting which projects are going to grow which kind of value and realizing you don't have to try and do it all. You just get clear on which piece do you want to do with that project. And especially if you're working with several projects, then you can kind of coordinate that so that in total, they're working together to create a lot of value across the whole system or across the whole community. Um, so I really like the way that you, you facilitated that process and gave them permission to kind of zero in on different types of value in different projects. Yeah, it made sense. And that's kind of like in the strategic design space, which is where I, I specialize, that this capacity to zoom out really far and zoom back in and zoom out really far. So when we were designing the initiatives for, you know, that was a match for our purpose, yeah. we were able to zoom out far enough. And we had that sort of reach to know that we had not only our initiatives, but the initiatives of the organizations we were auspiced under, the initiatives of other people in our region that we wanted to build sort of like um, a network hive with. Um, so we knew we didn't have to, as you say, have each initiative target every single capital or even every single quadrant. Yeah. So um, of the five initiatives, we, dis we uh, wanted to prototype. One of them was to take a, a group of women through ULAB. Yeah. And so we decided, because we were looking for a learning experience, we were testing a few different, op a few different models. And I said, well, why don't we look at this thing around ULAB for the purpose of growing knowledge and social capital for the women in, in our community. Um, and so we wrapped some, some metrics. We wrapped metrics around all the initiatives. Um, the one of the women's I was working with, she was sort of, her baby was a mentoring program. So she, you know, we sat together one day in my living room and looked at both the meta impact framework, but then also an, um, a logic model yeah. and how we could combine the two to actually create very targeted quantitative data outcomes from, from first person, um, both qualitative and quantitative um, yeah. surveys. Right. And nice. So we kind of sat down and sorted that out. And 
you know, for, she did one for her mentoring initiative, which was one of the five initiatives. And I did this for the U lab and I was looking at, okay, how might we measure growth and knowledge capital or change, not even growth. Cause I'm making an assumption. That's what would happen. Maybe everyone just lost all their knowledge and it went backwards, but and how might we measure a change in, um, in social capital? And, uh, you know, basically we just sort of landed on for um, social capital. Um, interestingly enough, ULAB was measuring that as well. But we decided we'd measure um, via first person quantitative metrics, um, different types of connectivity. So we did like a before and after metric where, you know, what were, what were the number of connections you have with the people in the group before you participated in this? Then what was the number of professional connections you have with people that you're liaising, liaising with professionally? And then what were the number of really strong business connections you have that you were co-generating revenue for one another? And um, we did before and after, and I just got the results. So oh, wow. they grew um, the connect, just general connectivity by 128%. Wow. Professional connectivity by 70%, and then strong business connections by 8%. Wow. Because we have to report back to this larger organization that we're auspiced under to right. demonstrate that the interdependent relationship of the capitals across the system can grow the areas that they right. care about, right? Wow. Oh, that's awesome. And then we, um, we measured knowledge capital, again, using a first-person quantitative metric. And, um, you know, we just kind of use, we, we just kind of use sort of um, – it was a little less rigorous, but it was more around, you know, how many, um, how many new projects got initiated and how did people rate their experience in terms of impact yeah. on their business, their work, their career, impact on their leadership, um, an impact on their ability to initiate a new project that would develop their business. And then also um, the level of course completion. So yeah. with those stats, we got 25% said high impact on their business, work, and career, and 60% said good impact. Wow. Um, 45% high impact on their leadership capability and 40% good on, on leadership. Wow. And then um, I'm just excited about these metrics because I'm yeah, just it's very cool. excited to take something all the way through from strategy to implementation and go, oh my gosh, it worked. <laughs> um, and the impact on initiating new projects to develop their businesses, their work, or their career, 55% said yes. Wow. And yeah, so quite a few people also, um, they offer a certificate. So we were like looking at how many people actually took the certificate. Um, but 5% took the certificate, but 75% um, met between 50, 75% or above of course completion. So we had a very high level of engagement, we felt. Oh. Wow. And so now we can take all that together and wow. tell a really rich story about this particular for future wow. funding. And given, you know, those metrics, it's like part of what excites me about that, and, and I'm wanting you to comment on this, is it's like you're making the process of measuring, um, like, accessible to these women, right? And it's like, because part of my excitement about the framework is it, like, does what I call democratizes assessment and measurement, right? That's like you can use informal metrics or formal or professional. Most people assume you just have to use professional, like, third-party metrics you know, with like some research institution, you have to pay a lot of money and have those people with all their PhDs come in and do the research. Otherwise, it doesn't count. What I'm wanting to turn on its head is just that so that people can see they can measure things in a simple and formal way, qualitative or quantitative, first, second or third person. It's like there's a lot of simple ways you can measure something, make it visible, track it. So you start to get some insight as to what's happening, what are people saying, where are people excited, where is it not working? And then with that feedback, then you can iterate and design the next round. So tell me a little bit about kind of your experience of the power of, of making these realities visible with simple, easily accessible metrics and, and kind of how does that empower the women? How does that change what's possible in the kind of work that you're doing and the design work that, that you're passionate about? Well, on one level, um, we have this story to tell. So it's like the whole process has built the social capital of our little group right. um, exponentially. We're now the local university is talking to us. <laughs> they, they came to the organization that were auspiced under through us yeah. about how we could collaborate more and combine and co 
you know, sometimes it's about collaboration, but sometimes it's just, it's just about coordination, coordinating efforts and resources. So people are coming to this um, organization through our women's group inside the organization. So we've built not only our social capital, but the social capital of the organization we're auspiced under. And um, that sort of, you know, in Australia, the, the way funding flows is um, smaller not-for-profits are consolidating rather than competing right. for support, fund support. And so the more we can be doing that, the Australian way, there's a fly going by, um, the more we can be doing that, um, the, the more we're sort of at the table with other stakeholders serving our community where, you know, we can really have an impact and, and not just an impact for the sake of impact, but an impact that's in response to the needs that people are expressing they want to grow value around. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing is out of the whole process and out of, um, you know, ULAB being one of our particular initiatives, an incredible prototype got built and is in the process of being developed and tested by one of the women in our group, one of the women on our leadership team, which is about a, a online platform that's a network for communities of practice grounded in the principle of giving. Mm. And I won't go into the details, but we had a live test of, of wow. this prototype last week where she came in and she had cards yeah. that she had us playing. Yeah. It was a bit like playing a game. It's very energizing for everybody in the room to see that potential and to see that their own project that they that ca that came out of um, their participation um, not only can have impact, but that there's support around them and skills and capability to actually measure that impact so that they can tell their own story. And I guess you know, in that in the um, in the spirit of um, local cosmopolitanism, where you know, just building small transition projects on the ground where you are is another way to scale impact. Um, I think that can be very powerful for the women we're working with and the men we'd love to work with. Yeah, wow, very cool. You know, there's one thing that you've mentioned a few times I wanna explore with you is, you've highlighted how you use the Meta Impact Framework kind of alongside a number of other tools, techniques, processes, you know, from Keegan stages to, you know, human-centered design to, you know, a few others. Tell me a little bit about how, how did you find the Meta Impact Framework? How well does it play with other frameworks? Like, in what ways does, is it a good complement, or in what ways is it not? You know, because I think your experience in that is really useful for everyone who's trying to work with, you know, more than one model, because usually a single model doesn't cover everything you need to do in a project. So having some insight around how did it play well with kind of other, you know, systems, you know, um, methodologies, approaches that you're working with, you know, would be great to hear. Yeah, right. So I, um, I guess because I have a design orientation, I looked at it as a mapping tool. And in design, in general, this, this idea of being able to zoom out and zoom in and zoom out, to be able to zoom out and see a system is a common practice in design. And there's lots of different mechanisms for mapping. Like I guess in the systems world, the, the kind of causal loop diagrams is a way of mapping um, complexity. And in the design space, there's lots of different ways to map complexity for the purpose of making it object, not just for an individual, but for all the stakeholders to see, mm. you know, where potential breakdowns might be. Um, where how people are feeling what is that like from the consumer's perspective where might we intersect what can we expect um a, a challenging moment to be in the process for the consumer um so you see that a lot in service design where they have different mapping tools what i liked about this mapping tool is it's very inherent in design principle in general that design is not a linear process it's happening um you know there's a lot of multiplicity happening at, on a, at a synchronous level and by working with um, the meta impact framework, instead of you know integral methodological pluralism or the traditional four quadrant uh, story, the language in that map is really easy. You don't have to go into all the background of this is the individual subjective, and this is right. the, you can just say mindsets, behaviors, relationships, systems, and people get it a little bit faster, and they can use it as a framework mm. to map multiplicity. And then, you know, it's a way of starting to highlight, okay, you can use this as a framework. You can also use this as, you know, this sort of heuristic perspective. 
can you see that if you just focus here, you're going to miss the view from the window over here? You know, you can start playing around with sh mm. having people see parts to a whole. Yeah. And then, you know, and then looking at, okay, but also, and this was the case how we were working, the interdependency between these quadrants. And it's more than a framework. It's a, it's a system. I like to think about it like, and I don't know if I'm on a tangent now or if I'm still answering your yeah. question, but it's kind of like in chemistry, when you put like a compound in a centrifuge, and you spin it around and all the parts separate. I think of the meta impact framework as that. It's like right. if you spin it, everything separates for a moment in time, but that's not the real truth. Right. Yeah. After, you, after it's not, it all kind of blah, 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 smooches that, that together again. <laughs> so yeah. I use it as an opportunity for people to see multiplicity and um, mm. to see the system in a different way. Um, but it's not the, you know, it's not always the best tool or the right tool, but it is a tool that helps people mm. see synchronous perspectives. No, that's great. You know, one of the things I often emphasize is that the Men Impact Framework really enables multidimensional thinking. And I think this taps into what you're saying about working with multiplicity in a synchronous way and, you know, and just being able to inhabit multiple places in the, the landscape and kind of, you know, see, see the project from different angles and, you know, but to do that in a way that's integrative and has multiplicity, it's multidimensional and, and gets us out of the linear kinds of you know because so many frameworks are kind of like have a linear dimensionality to applying it in kind of a certain set sequence and part of what i'm interested in is finding you know methods of using the framework that are very dynamic you know non-linear that are you know working with multiplicity and you know that really kind of enable a different way of, of applying these kinds of frameworks which otherwise can look very cartesian very kind of you know, put things in boxes, you know, like it, it can lend itself to that type of, of use. But for me, that leaves out a lot of the richness that's possible with this kind of framework where, you know, where, and I love this image of the centrifuge, pulling it apart for a moment before it all comes back together in its complexity, right? And if, we, if we're just able to get a glimpse of that differentiation, then we can really appreciate the complex integration of those realities in a single occasion, right? And then we can be more attuned to designing in a way that's um, tending to those dimensions because we've been able for a moment to see them kind of pulled apart, differentiated in an appropriate way, um, even though we recognize that they actually all are kind of complexly related moment to moment. Um, yeah, it's funny. I'm off on another tangent, but that's kind of how Dan Siegel describes mind sight. You got to differentiate the parts to integrate them. Yeah. And I think particularly for the women, like in the beginning, we took the meta impact framework in its most basic form, transforming mindsets, transforming behavior. Trans and we put ourselves at the center. Oh, so nice. before we try to design anything else, we were like, well, we've got to design us. Yeah. Because it was very chaotic with everybody's opinions and perspectives mm. of what needed to happen and when it needed to happen and where people's strengths were. Um, and by doing that, we could go, well, what's our, you know, why are we doing this? What's our purpose? And that was kind of like our collective mindset. So we were the unit at the center yeah. of. I'm really that. glad that you're highlighting this because this was something I really emphasized in the work I've done around integral research. And the Med Impact Framework is an outgrowth of that work. But I haven't emphasized this point so much in the application of it. But I think it's really important that you aim it at yourself first. Right, and you get clear about how do I want to transform my own mindset, my own behaviors, the, the systems around me, my relationships. Like, how do I need to transform and have impact across those dimensions of myself in order for me to be in the project in a way that optimizes transforming those realities external to myself? Right. So it's like, how do we how do we recursively loop it back on ourselves so that we are actively part of the process as well, and we're not just using it. And in integral research, we talk about um, researching the researcher in the process of doing the integral research, right? And, and there are some you know, qualitative and postmodern approaches that do that, um, you know, so it's not a totally new insight. But I think an integral approach allows us to do it in a particular way that I think is you know, kind of new and exciting. So I'm really pleased to hear that you, you and the women you're working with kind of naturally started from that place. We had to because there was so much conflict. Because <laughs> it was like all these powerful women going, no, this, that. So we did that first. And um, by doing that, what happened was we, it took eight months to do that, to go, right. you know, to apply it to ourselves. Like we were the first iteration before we could then look outward. But when we stood up and presented the initiatives to 
and invited women to come and hear what, what we had, what we were thinking about. We had so much social um, capital. We had created so much pull in our community because wow, just by standing up together and building the strength of that container, the women were like, we want to get, we want to be in that club. Right. You guys seem so close. And, you know, we were presenting and I was presenting with someone else and all we did for eight months was, was you know, try and resolve conflict. You know what I mean? Wow. But they didn't feel that. All they could feel was the strength of the container and they could feel the mm. shared principles we were operating on that we had deliberately designed as a cohesive team and, and how organized and structured we were and how, you know, so people could just feel. And I, I guess, again, it kind of comes back to when you turn it inward on your self-organizing auto poetic social structure um it creates it cre it, it also creates um social capital in the form of whole brand equity that people right. um, like a social ecology that people want to dive into because mm. this idea of how you how to get people in the room how to yeah. get people engaged in the conversation um there's a whole set of conditions around that and i think mm. creating that pull that invitation that strong container is a big is a big condition Wow. Oh, that's very cool. So one last question and then, then we can wrap up. So tell me a little bit about where are you headed with your use of the meta impact framework? Like how is it playing into your master's research? Kind of what's your growing edge as a design practitioner um, in using this framework? Kind of like, you know, where, where are any holes or areas that you think need to be further developed in the framework to allow people like you to be able to use it more powerfully? So just kind of, so kind of future looking, kind of like what's on the horizon for you around this framework and next steps? Well, for me, I'm at an interesting point in my research because I think I was sharing with you earlier, I'm going to transfer from a um, master's coursework to a master's research um, right. program. Um, I'm really interested in... So in design, there are so it's kind of like a mirror of adult development. They have their own orders of complexity, you know, ranging from the design of an artifact like a toothbrush or to all the way out to the design of what they're calling, you know, transition realities or like the speculative future that we're going to have to step into as we transition from what is so about um, the consequences of how we're changing our, our natural world to what will be and our attachment around the stuff that we can't live without now and, <laughs> and, the, and the significance of that to try and design with that in mind rather than just design from the upper left, right. to design from the place of um, a material orientation and, and how both consciously and unconsciously we, are, we have deep attachment to the things we interact with that makes our lives the way we want them to be. So how can we really step into this new transition um, moment? And I know Michelle Bowens talks about that a lot in terms of new economic structures, you know, shifting from extraction to contribution systems. Um, but the design space is really like, you know, how is the physical and the material going to uh, create new feedback loops around people's uh, mindsets, behaviors, and relationships? And so I'm stepping into that space now with a bit of keenness and curiosity. Um, and I think I'm particularly interested in how me the, the meta impact framework can be a part of a transdisciplinary design toolkit for generative leaders as one of multiple meta frames yeah. to help navigate this transition. I think it's, it's, it fits very nicely into a few different other um, meta frames, and that's how I see using it. And I think particularly now where I'm exploring is around how do you create the conditions before people step into that transition? It doesn't always have to be an environmental crisis or a personal crisis. You know, how do you create the conditions of pull at different levels of thinking and how might um, those conditions lie in each of those quadrants or in each of those capitals to, to prepare people for what's coming? And that's, I think, the, the next sort of edge of, of my inquiry, which is going to ground further research mm. and practice. Yeah, wonderful. Wow, I'm excited to, to be part of that journey with you. And yeah, I'm just really appreciative of you being kind of one of the early adopters of the Meta Impact Framework and, you know, test driving it, you know, with these women and just also in the other, you know, design projects in your life. And also, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you that, you know, the result of you 
you know, posting in your blog on SC Design, you know, and talking about the Med Impact Framework early on, like one of the first postings you did, um, alerted someone who lives in the area to the work I was doing in this and then connected me um, to Alethea Springs, you know. And so, yeah, right. so it was interesting to me that, you know, you in Australia posting, you know, something on your site about this work, you know, grabbed the attention of someone here in the Bay Area and allowed me to connect with someone and become another one of the main case studies of early adoption. So it's just cool how this is already creating, you know, a community of practice of sorts. And now we're able to compare notes um, and we'll continue to do so. Um, well, if you remember, Sean, you designed that because in that master class, it was you were experimenting with how people could exchange value with you yeah. for delivering the course. And That's right. We agreed that I was going to write about the meta yeah. impact framework. So I'm really glad to hear that feedback that it then created like a, a, a generative wow. outcome for you yeah. in another way. So that's very rewarding and yeah. we should all, um, you know, be really grateful that that experiment went so well. Yeah. Yeah. Proof of concept. So, yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Susanna. It's great to see you. I'm excited to hear of the great work that you've been doing and yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to, as we've talked about, to be supportive of you with your, your master's work and research. So I look forward to continuing to engage you and, and we'll see where it all takes us. Wonderful. And just a hello to everybody there in Iceland. I wish I could be there with you. Yeah, great. <laughs> well, all right. Thank you. All right. Bye now.